Hello and welcome to Meet the Demands of 2020, a global mobility playbook. This is a webinar brought to you by Relocate Global with our sponsor and presenter today, Air Inc. I'm Fiona Murchie, Managing Editor of Relocate Global and with me as our presenter is Morgan Crosby, Global Growth Leader of Air Inc. So many of you will know about Relocate Global and Think Global People. We're a multimedia, we've been going a long time now, and we have plenty of resources that you can access to manage global mobility and international management across the world. So please do dip into our magazine, our online website, digital resources. So as I said, I'm the managing editor and I think I have a bit of a unique perspective looking at things from an HR publishing point of view, plus a knowledge of global mobility over 30 years. But I'm particularly passionate about building the global mobility community, which stretches around the world and has become a sophisticated industry. So we're delighted to have with us today, Morgan Crosby, um, global growth leader at Air Inc who has a wealth of experience on global mobility issues to share with you today. Morgan, over to you. Thank you so much, Fiona. And thank you for inviting me to present to your audience today and for everyone who's taken time to join this session. I hope that you learned something from the session and we will have a Q&A section at the end. So I look forward to that. And let's get started with the mobility playbook. I want to advance to the first slide we have here. And what I find really fascinating is that this concept of a mobility playbook and mobility as an agile organization um, was created prior to COVID-19. And you know, when I was preparing for this session, I thought, oh my goodness, let's take a look at this content and see if it still resonates. And what I found is that the content resonates more now than it ever did before. So what we have here is a method for you and global mobility becoming a trusted advisor to your organization, to acting like you are a business that offers solutions and products to your organization. And this is extremely important now in the world of COVID-19 that you truly understand the needs of your customers um, within your organization, because now we have different requirements uh, coming from the employee, from the business, and from the company. We are trying to prepare for this new normal. And in order to do that, we really need to be a proactive function. So at the heart of your playbook, you need to be agile. And this is extremely important because we're going to continue to experience change as the new normal. And we need to be nimble and able to uh, change quickly, rapidly over time and be flexible and react to uh, that new normal because it's going to be changing. And in order to be agile and to have that at the heart of our playbook, uh, we uh, can start first um, over here on the left-hand side of the slide by advising. And I want to be very clear about what I mean by advising, because sometimes you can be a reactive advisor. Someone picks up the phone, they call you, they ask you a question, you provide them good advice. That's a great thing to do within Global Mobility, and we should certainly be there for our customers in that way. But I really want us to emphasize the proactive side of advising. And what I mean by proactive advising is that we are engaging our customers. Remember, there are lots of customers within mobility, and I'll talk about that later, but we want to go out, we want to ask them questions, we want to understand what challenges they're facing, we want to understand what their needs are. Because when we can truly think like our customer from the outside in and get into their mindset, that's when we can start promoting and offering solutions that are meaningful to them. So I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. So right now, a lot of employees that are considering potentially relocating during COVID-19, once restrictions are lifted, are probably feeling a little bit of trepidation about that. You know, will the virus flare up? What about my family? What about healthcare and the location I'm going to? So if you can truly understand those needs, 
And then you can move on to the right hand side of this, which is aligning and offering products and services to meet the needs of your customer and really thinking again, what solutions can I put out there to help them? So in the case that I gave there of the employee having concern, you could enhance your duty of care offering, but you really have to be out there actively listening to understand what these issues are. And through the course of advising, uh, learning and understanding and aligning your products to the needs of your customers, you're actually going to encounter some things that you would like to change, but you cannot change. So for example, the technology might not exist. You might want to have a um, employee choice program with the employee be you know, able to slide up and down what they pick and choose based on your budget. And then you learn, oh, nobody has that technology, but that's something you'd really like to have. Um, and that's where this advocating, this being um, present, uh, challenging your partners within your network, joining groups, um, attending events, you can start advocating to influence change so that you can get what you need in order to have a successful mobility program. And I just want to go back to the agile, which is in the middle, is this is a continuous process. You know, we're not advising, aligning and advocating and stopping. We're doing this all of the time um, because we need to be prepared for change as a constant. So with that as the platform for our discussion, I'll dive into this in a little bit more detail. So um, I've talked a lot about getting to understand your your audience. And I think that one thing we have to really realize is that as a result of the COVID crisis, we are not going to return to business as usual. It is not going to be a situation where restrictions are lifted. We just go back to the policies and the practices we always had in global mobility and don't need to change a thing. That is not going to be what happens, right? We are going to need to change. And now is a great time to think about what changes are needed. And I'll tell you what, if you're not thinking about it, your competitors that you compete for talent are because Eric's consulting practice is extremely busy right now with the phone ringing, asking for help, figuring out how to change their programs to um, be ready for this new normal. So if you're not thinking about it, you should be. And the best way to you know, spend this time while we're sort of on lockdown and, you know, expats can't really move at the moment. This is a great time to get to know what your customers are thinking about. So reach out to them, engage them, ask them what it's going to look like when we start to resume uh, normal or partial operations. And I really want to challenge you to listen actively. I'll have some steps on how to do the best way of engaging people. But the adage that you have two ears and one mouth for a reason is an important adage to remember, because in order for you to actively listen and to truly understand what changes are needed, you're going to have to do a lot more listening than talking. So while you were reacting to COVID-19 and being out there and having to answer questions and truly um, respond, respond, respond. This is now when you're a sponge and you're trying to soak up information and understand the changes needed. And I'll give you some tips on how to do that because we need to be outside in, we need to be thinking like the customer um, so that we can pivot our offerings to what they're going to need in this new normal. And then again, you need to be prepared for change as a constant. This feedback loop needs to be happening regularly. You need to set up your mobility function to change on a dime and to be ready to change. And I don't want you to knee jerk and just change for change's sake. I just want you to be prepared to have an agile approach. Long gone are the days are when we would uh, benchmark our program and have our policies in place for five years and think we were in good shape. That's not the way it happens anymore. We need to be ever evolving and evergreen. So let's take a poll and I'm going to have Fiona help me with the poll. Um, the poll question is, do you plan to revise your mobility program this year as a result of COVID-19? Fiona, can you uh, launch the poll please? Great, so people are taking the poll and we have uh, the information coming in while we're um, looking and the answers are yes, no, or maybe. And I'm not sure that the poll is closed yet, 
But while we're going through this, it's looking pretty likely that companies are going to be changing their program. Um, so Fiona, um, just let me know when you think it's time to uh, end the poll. We're getting a lot of good answers here and, and answers seem to be coming in still. Yeah, well, at the poll at the minute, we put about 45% saying yes, and maybe 42%, 11 saying no. So is that what you were expecting, Morgan? Pretty much, yes. I think that um, we're not getting a lot of no's, right? 10% are saying no. That's great. Um, you know, so a, a small portion are fine with what they have. Um, but, you know, about 50% right now in the poll are saying they are going to change it. And about 40% are going to consider changing it. So change is indeed the new normal. And we're going to be expecting change um, going forward. Um, and that's why, you know, joining webinars and groups like this are so important because it's great to keep a pulse um, with what's going on um, in the industry. So I'll just go ahead and hit the end poll button here. And we published this at 46% saying yes and 42% maybe and 11% no. So I don't know about you all, I'm a little tired of change, um, but I think we have to get used to it and um, just move forward and expect more coming in the year. So moving on um, to the content, um, there are a lot of things that Global Mobility does. And you know, I just want to try to put things into buckets and help sort of have you have a guide to see where you can focus in on your efforts and where you can think about adding value and where you might want to place your emphasis in 2020. So, you know, at um, in Global Mobility, we operate, um, we enable the employee to have a good experience, we advise the business, and we help the talent planning and the talent workforce, right? So we have these four things that we're doing within our companies. And you notice we have this as a pyramid because, you know, the the more we do, um, the closer we get up the pyramid, the closer we get to more of the strategic or value add aspects of what we do in global mobility. Not that compliance um, and operations aren't value add, they're just table stakes. It's a given. You have to be compliant. You have to move families. You have to pay them. You know, this is important work that we do, um, but it's a given that you need to do it. So the more we, you, we go up the pyramid, the more we add value to the company when we give the employee a great experience and they're, they're enhance their commitment to the organization or we provide you know, good advice to the business so that they can meet their P&L requirements or meet their business needs, or we help the company figure out how to do business on a global scale and, and leverage the talent to do that. So these are all important things, but the things at the top are you know, the more value add. And then if we break these things down into three things, we have the operational aspects of mobility, which you know are it's important that we're you know being compliant and the compliance rules are changing. So we have to reinforce that. And then on the right hand side, this part of what mobility does is getting pinged a ton right now. And this is the functional expertise around operational compliance and advising the business. And this is right now you know, understanding the ever-changing immigration rules, what countries are open or not open, um, what's going to happen with taxation, what's the guidance um, for temporary relief within COVID-19 and what's going to happen when that's lifted. And this functional expertise around immigration and taxation and permanent establishment, all of this is getting pinged a lot right now and a lot during COVID-19. And my guess is, that your organizations have a new found respect for you and your ability to have all of this functional knowledge. Now you're drawing on your partners, probably at your immigration partner or your tax partner to help you through this, but you're the face of the company to help get through this. And so this functional expertise is an extremely important part of what mobility does. And I think we're going to see this become an enhanced value add piece of what mobility does and something that companies rely on even more because of COVID-19. So if you haven't enhanced or reinforced this part of what you do, you should. And then on the top, we have the advisory and the aligning, which is where you're going to start to take that information you have learned when you're listening with your two ears and use that to help make advice about how we can change going forward. Um, so if you hear um, from the organization um, that we need to, um, you know, for example, a, a good a good example of what might happen from a talent workforce planning standpoint, we may enter a period where due to supply chain uh, concerns, 
companies or you know countries decide that they want to reshore uh, some of the operations in the supply chain so that they don't rely on just having things manufactured in China or Vietnam and only having that one supply chain that can mess them up, right? So a company in manufacturing might decide to regionalize their manufacturing and reshore it back to the US or reshore some to Latin America. And that means that the the where the work is needing to be done is going to shift, right? And if that happens, then you need to be there to say, well, if we do that, um, let's not send an expat at that, right? This is a permanent structural change we're going to be making. We need to one way move people and we need to figure out how to handle these group moves. And I can help with that, right? So that's an example of if you're doing the advisory and the lining well, and you have that seat at the table and you can help with that talent and workforce planning, you're proactively advising the company on how best to execute on that new strategy and you're getting ahead of the issues rather than waiting until they tell you, oh boy, we need a bunch of people to go to you know, the US now that can do manufacturing and we've never manufactured in the US. So this is an extremely important part. Um, you, know, you need to be paying attention to all of these areas of the pyramid and making sure that your organization is set up to do these different things. And different people within your global mobility function are going to have different competencies. And some are going to be good at operations, some are going to be good at advising. Maybe you actually don't even have these skill sets. So if you need them, you need to build them. Um, so this becomes part of your playbook, knowing where you need to play um, and what spaces and what competencies you need in order to help uh, execute going forward. So I just want to bring in some stats that we had from our 2020 um, mobility outlook survey. And actually, before I do that, um, I see a question we have from somebody that I, I wouldn't mind taking. Um, what benefits would you recommend um, changing in the policy? We already have an emergency repatriation clause, which covers pandemics. That's fantastic that you have an emergency repatriation clause to cover pandemics. I would say it's also really important to know, like, what are you going to do going forward if employees want to voluntarily leave the location? You should probably have a policy for that. Um, I would also say that you need to enhance your duty of care offerings, um, because if you don't have all of the appropriate um, insurance coverages or well-being checks, um, knowing if the employee is going to a location where their health can't be managed if they're um, an at-risk person, I think that's great. Um, so I think it's time to be, you know, look at all of your um, duty of care issues and make sure um, that you, um, you know, have a robust. I think also too, um, it's if you don't have an unaccompanied assignment or a way to do um, virtual type assignments or, you know, not a traditional commuter, but maybe limited exposure assignment. Um, those are things that you should think about looking at too. So thanks for that question. And I did see that on the chat, so keep chatting. Um, and to go back to the current focus and the results from Mobility Outlook Survey, um, th this was done before COVID-19, but it's fascinating to me that companies said in, on average that 59% are focused on reactive problem solving and only 41% are focused on proactive problem solving. And you know, looking at the numbers at tech, we, we always think that tech companies um, are ahead of the game. Um, their numbers were 71% reactive and 29% proactive. And it's important to have a mix of these, right? Like we couldn't predict that we were going to have this pandemic and that we we're gonna to have to be in react mode. That react mode happens, that's okay. But I would like to challenge you all, you know, as you get up and go to work every day, um, saying, how can I be proactive today, right? What can I do to be just a little bit more proactive? Who haven't I picked up the phone and called recently, asked their opinion? Um, am I really having the pulse of what's going on in my organization? So, um, you know, this is important for you to challenge yourselves every day to be just a little bit more proactive um, because you'll get better outcomes. And then moving forward, I, I promised that we would talk about, you know, how to do some of this proactive engagement. And on the left hand side, you know, we have to have client engagement skills. I mentioned at the beginning that, you know, mobility is a business. We offer solutions. We help our customers. That means we need to be good at engaging our customers, right? We're not just doing customer service, which is reactive. We're doing client engagement, which is reaching out and being a trusted advisor. 
And, you know, just listening isn't enough. You need to discern patterns and you need to form strategic relationships with your clients. And you have to identify who your clients are within your organization. And, you know, there are the classic ones. The employee is your customer or client. The business is your client. But there are other clients, right? Talent acquisition is emerging as a much bigger client of global mobility than ever before, um, especially in, in organizations that are competing for talent and they're competing for talent that requires relocation. And this is where talent acquisition is, is an important uh, organization to know and have a relationship with. You know, you need to also have a relationship with HR, with finance and leadership. And specific to leadership, if you don't have a champion within your organization that really gets mobility, that really wants to promote mobility within the company, it's really going to be hard for you to get big changes through your executive leadership team. So identify someone who can be your executive champion. If you don't have the you know, influence or standing within your organization, you might not be able to have that in relationship with the executive champion, but you might need an intermediary because as you listen and think about the changes that need to be made, you also have to influence change, right? And you have to influence the people who make the decisions within your company. So don't forget to form relationships with the leaders as well as your customers. And then once you form these relationships, I've said this already, you need to regularly engage them. And you need to use data and information to influence them. We're going to talk about how to use metrics and, and information to help influence change. And, you know, don't forget to mine your partner network. Your partners have tons of information. Um, they know often sometimes, especially if you're outsourced, your RMC might be knowing more about what your employee needs than, than you will. Um, they might be knowing what the immigration needs are more than you are. So, you know, don't forget to go to your partner network for, for really good information. And if you're doing all of this engagement really well, you should have your elevator speech, right? You should be able to say, what is it that mobility does for my organization, right? Um, does mobility just enable us to do business across borders? That, that's fine. Uh, mobility could enable you to have a global workforce and build the future pipeline of the company. You need to be able to have that elevator speech because if you know what success is and you can communicate that vision, people know what your value proposition is, and you can measure success over time and tell people how you're performing. Um, so it's really important to have that elevator speech and understand, you know, what what you do for the company. So you can't execute on your playbook if you don't know what it is you're 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 doing for that organization. So once you've listened to your customers, define that vision for success and be able to clearly articulate it. And, you know, how do you be a client engagement person? Um, a lot of global mobility professionals grew up maybe in HR or compensation. Uh, you know, maybe you grew up on the operations side or tax side, immigration side. Maybe you never were in customer service or client engagement. Um, you might not have those skills and you could sharpen them up, right? Um, so the tips are do that proactive outreach um, and then ask open-ended questions. I love open-ended questions. So remember there are closed questions and there are open-ended questions. So let's say we go to the business and we say, do you need to save money as a result of COVID-19? That's a closed question. They're going to say yes or no. Well, how much information did you get out of them? Not much, just that they need to save some money. Uh, that's helpful to know, but it would be more helpful to say, what is your cost environment looking like for you um, as a result of COVID-19, right? So that's an open-ended question and they will provide you with a free-flowing response. And they might say something like, you know, I'm really concerned about cost. Um, our revenue is down. My P&L isn't looking great. Um, but I'm also concerned that I can't get the work done that I need done in this location without an expat. And right now, expats are not really wanting to come to my location. So they might say to you something like, um, you know, a lot of stuff right there, the, a bunch of things. You need to summarize and test your understanding and resist the temptation to solve, right? You can't be like, oh, I can help you with that. I can save money by doing this or, um, you know, don't do that. You, you need to first say, if I heard you correctly, 
cost is a concern for you right now, but you're also concerned about the ability to attract talent into this location and you need expats. So do you need to balance those costs or are you looking to perhaps just stay the course with the policies as is because the concern about attracting and recruiting people is greater than the cost concern? And then they can provide you with more information and you can get better understanding of what's needed and that give and take, that conversation using your two ears and your one mouth can get you to a better relationship with that person because you've truly heard and understood them. So how do you get business feedback and what might they tell you? You can do it verbally. You can interview them. You can talk to them. You can also do surveys of them. Um, either way is fine. Um, but I want to show some cases um, that I have here. And um, at Air Inc, we run a lot of surveys of the business to find out what they value um, so that we know how to orient uh, offerings towards what they value. And, and during this time, we're going to have different types of answers that we get from the business. I have a sample survey result here. This was from a live company. And we asked them what they considered to be the most important purpose of an international assignment or transfer. And the number one answer was to help the company meet long-term talent objectives. And the number two answer was to provide professional development opportunities for the employee. So this is an organization who is wanting to be employee-centric. They want to use mobility to promote their talent agenda. And I'm going to call them case number one. Their business has been accelerated by the crisis. Uh, they might make cleaning supplies or medical supplies. Um, they might be in, in groceries, what have you, um, e-commerce, and they have a critical talent shortage. And this may lead them to actually enhance their offerings um, as a result of COVID-19. Um, by the way, we do have somebody uh, commenting that they're not able to hear anymore. Can I just test quickly to see if people are hearing me? I'm not getting a response. Okay, some people, we do have a few people that are having trouble hearing, but lots are saying they can hear. They had to reconnect. Okay, so we're fine. Thank you for, for letting me know. All right, great. So um, this, just going back to this case, um, we have the business accelerated by the crisis. And the second one is that the business has been decreased by the crisis. And that has happening a lot, unfortunately, right? We have companies that are suffering, um, which is, 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 I hope, temporary. Um, but, you know, these organizations might have cost effectiveness be their focus at the time. So, you know, what we might hear from them is that, you know, they just need expats to fill staffing or needs in a location. That might be the answer we get from them. Um, so let's think about these two cases, one where the business is accelerated um, because of the crisis and one where it's been decreased because I'm gonna bring these back um, and, and some upcoming slides. So we can't just canvas the business. We also have to um, you know, get employee feedback. And we really need to enhance this human eccentric design um, as a result of COVID-19. We are finding out more and more about the employee employer contract as a result of COVID-19. And you know, what's what's really important here is that we take care of our employees. And I think we've we've been reinforced and learned that employees need extra care during this time, and they will going forward. And we also need to be mindful of employees' personal needs. And we've all become a lot more aware and acutely um, involved in people's personal lives. You're all seeing my home right now. I mean, on what, you know, in the past you would have never seen inside my own home. And so we're a lot more attuned to people's individual needs, their personal preferences, the fact that we are working with humans. And now more than ever, we need to be human centric. And human centricity in global mobility design was already underway prior to COVID-19. Um, and I would like to say, if you didn't start thinking about all of the personas and the individuals that you have within your organization um, before COVID-19, you do need to do it now. And if you did it before, keep doing it. 
um, because we are humans and we all have unique needs. And a lot of global mobility, mobility policies were designed in the past to be process oriented or prescriptive or had bias as to who we were serving. You know, often HQ outbound or HQ inbound, high level manager, um, you know, but really, People have lots of different needs. So we need to think about that. And I'm going to talk more about that. Um, but, you know, let's understand the reasons why people take assignments. Um, on the left hand side, we have some results from one company that it was to enhance my long term career and to gain professional development. One of the potential answers was I was asked by my manager to take an international assignment transfer. It's important to know which bucket you fall in. If you have employees that take assignments for career opportunities, they're excited to go, they want to go, that's great. If you're asking people to take assignments for business criticality reasons, let's say um, you're a company who makes disinfecting solutions that are going to help you know, a particularly hard hit country and you need to send an expat into that hard hit country and you're asking them to go, by all means, that is somebody you're going to need to um, really take care of properly because um, you know they're they're going um, for you, right? Because you need them to go, and that country needs them to go. Um, so know why you're sending these people. And then on the right hand side, you know we have what are the barriers that the employee is perceiving about taking an assignment, and you know it could be that they don't want to go because of disruption or family. But down in the middle here, we have concerns about medical care and, and company support for well-being. You need to know what the barriers are so that you can address them in your policy. And that's why when we had the question earlier about, you know, whether or not what do we need to change in our policies, this is where we need to enhance the well-being offerings um, that we have. Um, so, you know, understanding the employee um, and their needs and their barriers we can address the barriers if we know what they are. And if we know their motivations, we can enhance those motivations. And then I wanna talk more about this human centricity um, and the personas. Um, I've talked a lot about the client personas like talent acquisition, you know, their lens or the business's lens or the enterprise lens. I think we know that those are important lenses and they need to be considered in, in our playbook. But I've talked also about getting to know the employee personas. And this is where looking at personas and challenging yourself to think like these different personas and, and then reading your policy and saying, am I, am I inclusive of all these different types of personas? Am I being, am I being uh, flexible enough to meet these needs? We're going to need to be doing that, right? So I have some cases here. We have a mid-career LGBTQ employee assigned to London. Um, we have a single female mid-career assigned to China from the UK. We have an Eastern European national with a partner and two young children assigned to Argentina where there's no uh, school that, uh, in the language that they're used to. You know, we have to realize that all of these different people are the people we're sending on assignments. And this is where we're going to need increased flexibility to make sure that we can meet these inclusivity needs and, and stop being prescriptive. And that's why we've seen the rise in policy of flexible choice allowances, of uh, talking to the employee about what their needs are when they go on assignment. And we saw this a lot with COVID-19 where the best practice companies picked up the phone and called each family out on an assignment and said, hey, what is it that you need to feel comfortable right now? Um, and really listen to those employees and if we could do something for them, we did. And if we couldn't, at least we listened to them, right? So don't forget to keep doing that. And let's bring back our case studies. Remember case study one, uh, the business has been accelerated because of COVID-19. And um, now we can start articulating our vision for success and our value and how to deliver on it, right? So this organization, um, this is their statement. Um, and this is an actual company that I'm working with right now. And I would challenge you to think, could you state these four or three, four things about your company? They don't have to be four, two or three things, whatever they are that are most important for you, right? What is it that we do at this organization? We enable the business to make different talent investments. We engage talent through personalized experiences. Global mobility promotes our talent agenda and our approach is inclusive. What do I feel when I say those things? I really feel employee-centric. 
I feel flexible. I feel like we're here to support the business and the employee and we'll do what it takes, you know, within reason to do that. And that's why this company offers a core flex business policy. They have a flexible spending allowance to meet the employee's personalized needs. They consider the employee's short and long-term career objectives when choosing the assignment type. And they have diversity and inclusion uh, approaches to help take into consideration any unique needs for that employee. So this feels very employee-centric, very flexible, right? That's one company. Now, another company, um, the one that's being challenged um, by financial situation during the crisis is going to have to have a different position. They don't have the luxury of being flexible and employee friendly as much as they would like to be. So they have to dial to a different position, but they still have a duty of care, still have an important role to play. So their role to play is duty of care is our primary goal. Our approach is cost effective. We are purposeful in selecting assignments and global mobility is agile. So this feels, you know, a bit more operational, a bit more focused on the financials, um, but that's what's required, right? So they invest more money in the well-being aspects of their program, but the rest of their program, while it offers the normal employee allowances, are done so at a very uh, conservative level. So they've invested more in duty of care and less in the other allowances. They counsel the or the business on whether or not maybe a local talent could be used um, versus an expat. And if expat makes sense, great. But if a local talent makes more sense and it's more cost effective, awesome. So they're helpful at selecting the right assignment type. And they're ready to make change, right? They're ready to pivot as, as things change. So they're very mindful of the business, right? So you can see how different companies are gonna have different flavors and you should be really good about talking about what you do and how you respond to it. I'm so sorry. We're, I'll try. I, we're getting uh, somebody saying they can't see the slide because my my camera is in the way, my photo, and I'm not sure I can change that. We'll be sharing the slides um, at the end. So um, Sarah, who raised that, um, will send the slides at the end so you can see more on the uh, global mobility is agile side. I'm sorry, my picture is um, is covering that up. Um, so. How do we know, once we, we know what we're successful, right? Like we enable the business or we give flexibility or we promote diversity and inclusion. Um, so, you know, the, those, once we know what success is, um, we can start measuring it, right? And there's nothing like data and stats to prove a point. And, you know, to really understand um, if we're performing well, right? I mean, we could have a sense, oh, I feel like I'm doing well, but there's nothing like hard facts um, to prove your point. So why don't you start, if you haven't already, um, start building your database of information. And I'll, I have some, some tips on this, but you know you can start with descriptive information, right? Which is how many employees do we deploy for how long, what's their performance rating? But over time, you can build that data over a longer period. How many repatriate? How many leave the company? How many get promoted? Um, how many times that we've picked an expat over a local hire, did we get better performance from the expat than we did from the local hire or the other way around, right? So once we start to get this information and it builds over time, we can start to form uh, predictive um, or prescriptive uh, influencing information, right? So, and, and that power of that is, is, is huge. So if you aren't mining data yet, you should start mining it. And you know, use that to tell stories, to promote your progress, and communicate with stakeholders. And you know, here's a success definition. Um, this is just for you know a particular company. It uses the pyramid that we talked about at the beginning with the operations, experience, talent, and organizational goals. You don't have to use the pyramid, but if you define what success is you can then measure it. And it's only when you know what success is that you can measure and report on it. So I would challenge you if you haven't yet defined success within your organization, in one year we'll have achieved this, in two years we'll have done that, or our, our mobility serves this function, please uh, do that. And then how do you do this measuring? Um, once you've defined success, you can describe the state of mobility. And we know 70% of companies are using descriptive reporting. And that's just where are expats, where are one-way moves, how many short-term assignees do we have, 
um, you know, how many are coming up on the assignment. And that's kind of cool information to have, but it's just descriptive. Um, and then I talked about doing this predictive um, and I'm, I know my camera is close, is covering this uh, slide at the beginning, but only 34% of companies are using predictive analytics, which is when we can start saying, hey, if I use an expat um, versus a local hire, do I get better or different outcomes? Um, do I have higher performance among expats than I do others? Uh, how many uh, females have I sent out on the assignment? And is that promoted? the number of females that we have within the upper ranks of our organization? Um, and how do I you know, have a successful assignment for females? So that's the predictive analytics that you can start getting into, but not many people are doing that yet. And I would also challenge you to, to go into that space. Um, so with that, we have poll question number two. Um, and I wanna just say like, you know, analytics are a great way to raise your profile um, within the organization. COVID-19 has risen the profile of global mobility within companies hugely. You've been involved in all of the, the task force conversations, I'm sure. And so I just wanna do a quick poll, um, and Fiona, if you could launch this poll for me. Um, has this has COVID-19 um, given you a seat at the table? And do you think after COVID-19 that you'll continue to have that seat at the table or will it go back to where it was before when you didn't have that seat at the table? And so far I'm getting some heartwarming um, results, which is that we think this seat at the table is going to continue, um, which is what we want to hear. So I hate to say it, that there might be a silver lining in this crisis, but if it means that we've raised the profile of mobility and it sticks, that would be really great. Fiona, do you have anything else you wanna to add to that before we close the poll? No, I think that's extremely encouraging because people have been talking at that, talking about that at conferences for years and writing about it. So that's really great. Excellent. So I'll end the poll. Um, and we got 55% said they think they'll have a seat at the table, 31% maybe, and only 12% no. So yeah, great, great news. Excellent. So um, just we're almost coming to an end and then we can enter into a Q&A. Uh, session for those of you that do have questions. And I mentioned at the beginning of this that advocacy is a big part of your playbook, right? Um, not everything that you want to do will be available to you. Um, and so you need to influence and, and to help change, right? Um, you know, immigration laws might not be what you want them to do. You can lobby your uh, governments. Um, you might need technology that you don't have Maybe it exists, but you, your company won't let you spend the money. Um, or maybe the feature you need on your technology is not yet available, but you'd really like it to be. Um, and so, you know, these are all of the things that are getting in the way of you realizing your vision, that the nice to have that you just don't have. And you need to be able to influence and have external advocacy to, to change those things, either to get the funding within your own organization and build the business case, or work with your partners in order to get what you need. And so just some tips on that. Um, you know, you know, we talked about forming relationships with key in leaders and learning to influence. Data is a great way to influence. Um, adding value every time you meet with leaders is a great way to influence. Also partner networks. Uh, a lot of your partners, immigration, tax, cost of living, um, RMC, they have client advisory boards. If if they can't offer you what you want from them, get on their advisory board, tell them, get involved with that company, become an advocate um, and a collaborator with your partners. There's nothing like investing in your partners for them to really um, have a valued relationship with you as well. And then there are industry groups such as the ERC, um, other local groups. There's a lot of advocacy within those. Get involved, right? It's not just your internal company that you need to get involved with. You need to get involved externally as well. And that brings us back to the advising, aligning, advocating, and agility that I've been talking about. I just wanted to remind you of that um, before I close out with the playbook and the takeaways, which is you need to form the playbook for you at your organization. It's going to be focused on you. I gave you some case studies, but I want, I'm challenging you. Um, you know, to do your own playbook. And with that, we need to understand your client's needs. You need to form relationships and actively listen. You have to clearly articulate your vision for mobility. 
measure and report on success. And you need to set a path for progress and be agile along the way, realizing that you're knowing going to change. And so with that, Fiona, I already have a question here. Do you want me to just grab it from the chat or were you going to do the questions in a different way? No, I should just grab, grab that question as you saw it. Okay, cool. So we have a question that says, in an economic downturn, like we are no doubt facing, how would you expect global mobility teams to adjust what they do in-house versus what they outsource to partners? This is a really interesting question um, because I know that some companies have had um, questions about um, supply chain, um, you know, availability, um, and you know whether or not um, all of their partners are prepared to to assist in in these cases. I think we found that they they have been, which has been great. Um, I would actually expect that companies will want to do some of the employee um, relationship management a little bit stronger in-house and rely on the outsourcers to do a lot, you know, the more of the operational bits for them um, so that the in-house individuals can focus on um, their proactive advising internally. Um, so then we have another question here. Um, how any tips on how we can improve the international experience for employees during COVID-19? So this is a great question. The most important thing that you can do is communicate, communicate, communicate. Pick up the phone, call your employees, stay in touch with them, have a SharePoint site, have videos, have resources available to them, and just keep a good pulse on them. And then I would say continue to advance um, and invest in the duty of care and be flexible and realize people are humans and have unique needs. Don't uh, feel the need to um, solve for the policy, be more flexible. Um, we have another question here. Um, we have a lot of companies realizing now that having their employees working remotely from home, they might not need to invest in expats anymore. So how do you see the global mobility function to evolve? I, I definitely think we will see some more um, some more uh, virtual assignments that replace expats, but not all jobs can be done remotely. Um, you know, manufacturing, oil and gas, um, corporate functions, you know, with signing ability, the, you know, high level jobs, they're going to still need to be expats. But yes, we probably will see a reduction in traditional expats, but we might see an increase in virtual workers or a new type of commuter, not the commuter we think of, but maybe people who fly in and fly out from time to time. And that will need global mobility to enhance that subject matter expertise around how do we make all of this work? How do we deal with immigration needs? How do we deal with the tax needs? How do we track these people? Um, so I think global mobility will end up having to deal with a much wider array of, of um, cross-border or mobile talent. And it might not be the traditional expat. That will be one of the responses. And, and we were having new and different types of assignments before. I think that's just going to become even more complicated. So I think global mobility as a trusted advisor and someone who can help sort through all of this chaos is going to be needed to help help with that. So yes, virtual assignments will replace some expats, but then we'll just get other things in return. Um, we have it's a about lump sum there. Um, do you want to talk about that, Morgan? Do you think sure. that lump sums will stop due to increased need for duty of care provisions? It's a really fascinating question, right? Because there are different types of lump sums, right? Um, there's a managed lump sum, which is not a cash allowance. So let's say you calculate out a lump sum to include uh, flights, temp living, accommodation, look-see trip. And that lump sum, when you calculate it out, would be 12,500 euros, right? You could pay that as cash, or you could say, I'm giving you a budget of 12,500 euros to um, help you with these following things. Um, use it as you need to use it. The power of that is that it's cost predictive to the company. It keeps costs down and it gives the employee choice. So maybe we won't see lump sums as cash allowances, but maybe we'll see them as a budget that people can draw off of to get the duty of care, to get the service, 
but for them to draw off the services that they value, right? So like maybe the lump sum will just pivot to a managed lump sum. Um, and I do think maybe instead of lump sums that are meant to cover everything for the relocation, what we might see are lump sums that are for the employee choice aspects, right? The, the discretionary items. So not the things that we need to get them relocated, but lump sums that give them employee choice and preference, we might see those, right? Because we do need to be more human centric. So I could see a pivot away from here's some money, relocate yourself. You know, that that's a little risky at the moment. Um, but I could see creative ways at, at getting similar, similar uh, effects. Um, Fiona, did you see other questions on there that might be? Well, I think there's one that sort of um, segues into that about somebody talking about is it the right time to review supply partnerships and renegotiate uh, travel spend, um, e.g. numbers of night pricing, etc. Um, but equally, um, I had a question, do you, do you recommend using trusted suppliers for lump sums or do you, uh, how much control do you think people need to have over these? Wow. <clears throat> um, I, I am a huge advocate of the managed relocation cap, which is like a lump sum. And like I said, it's a bucket of money that gets deposited into the employee's account and they can draw off of that for the services that they want. So they can use the preferred suppliers um, and get preferential um, arrangements um, with that the company has negotiated. And if they don't wanna use those services, um, they don't have to, they can cash out the allowance if, if they prefer. And then we can leave the duty of care stuff outside of that so that we make sure we give that service. I'm a huge fan of that. Um, and I have to admit, I'm, my knowledge about supply chain is, is very limited. So questions about that, I will have to take away and find um, somebody that is better qualified to answer those. Yeah. Well, I'd have thought it's a good time to be sticking with your suppliers and supporting them because a lot of them will be in tricky situations and you'll need them when you're when you get busy again, I'm sure. And you, um, have, I, better, you have better arrangements with them, right? You have a, a, an agreed arrangement. So I agree. Yes, I think we're aligned. I was also interested in when you were talking about the trusted advisors, uh, so that's something you, you do. Um, can you give us a bit more information about, um, without disclosing obviously company names, how you share, um, how you act as a company advisor, a trusted advisor with companies and what it is you do in mobility for them? At, at Air Inc? Yeah. Yes. Um, so a lot of what we do is to challenge people's thinking and to turn their notions upside down and have them look at things from different angles. So, and I think a trusted advisor does that, right? They challenges, they challenge people's thinking, they bring fresh ideas, they test ideas out with them, and they solve problems with unique and innovative solutions. And that's what we need to be doing right now because we're in a whole new world and we can't rely on what we've done before. So for me, a trusted advisor challenges thinking, comes up with new solutions, partners um, to add value to that organization. Great, that's really useful. And then there's been quite a lot of debate going on about shifting from the why to the how. Um, across well not only global mobility but all sorts of things and where what's what's your company's reason what's your purpose mm -hmm. um, so do you think that that is a worthwhile debate now moving from why you're doing something to how you're doing it so I think it's a great debate because I think before we were really focused on the why right like we need to be purposeful we need to be mindful we need to be thinking of why we have assignments and, and designing for that. And we may have overemphasized the why while you know not thinking about the how as much, right? Um, because it was fashionable to be focused on the why. And right now the how is extremely important, right? We've, we've realized like, how do we move people? How do we, you know, I've had somebody who's returned from an assignment temporarily and now they can't get back and I have to move their goods. And the how has come back into fashion as something that we need to do and do well um, and need to be able to execute on. And so 
I think that right now we need to elevate both the why and the how and pay very close attention to both and be excellent at both. I don't know what your thoughts are um, on that, Fiona. Yes, I, 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 I think the shift to how is, is long overdue, really. And that's one of the areas that we were exploring and trying to get people from different disciplines to communicate together to tease out um, what the solutions are. And it's all too easy. Uh, has been to get stuck in silos and HR and global mobility separate from other divisions and the leadership team and the finance, etc. But learning and development and change management and all these people have huge amounts of knowledge that can also be shared and really help the whole organisation um, come up with what, what is this new purpose and how are they going to deliver it to their clients and to their employees and and you know, we're all about now, I think, contemplating how are we going to build this better world <laughs> and mm -hmm. things like climate change come into that, um, resilience, um, agility, as, as you've mentioned before. So I think there are lessons to be learned. Perhaps that's some of the, on a reflective mode, perhaps that's one of the good things <laughs> that's come out of it, people taking uh, a pers different perspective on things. Well, yeah, and I have a great example of that, Fiona. Yeah. A client of mine um, is having now regular immigration town halls at his company. It's a broadcast. People can are invited to attend, and they update the whole company on what's going on with immigration. That's an example of how, and an example of communications. He's using the learning and development platforms they have within their company. So this is, you know, that communication, getting the word out, Awesome. I, I like what you said there. Yeah. And also just give it a go. I think, of, as you say, you've had people in your home today. <laughs> and so people are not so worried about um, other things. So it doesn't matter if people make mistakes, does it really? Just give it a go. See what works for your organization. Yes. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Morgan. That's been a really uh, engaging and interesting um, playbook session. Um, and the concept of playbook and the terminology has been, I think, been new to quite a lot of people, but it sounds interesting and exciting. So thank you so much for bringing that to light. You're welcome. I enjoyed attending. Thank you. <laughs> and of course, we will be sharing the slides with everybody. It'll be within 24 hours or 48 hours. So and people can listen back as well. So just to remind you that this is a, a webinar brought to you by Relocate Global in association with Air Inc. And we're delighted to have had Morgan join us today. There's plenty more resources on the website and so too have Air Inc. have got plenty of follow-up information as well. So do get in touch. And as I said, there will be a link sent to you uh, to get the presentation slides and Morgan will be delighted to hear from you with any more questions. So that just leaves me to say, please do continue to join with the global mobility community. Whatever Relocate Global can do to enhance things and make communication better, we're there to support you all. So please send us your ideas and uh, say stay for and well, and do challenge some pre preconceptions and look for solutions with partners around the world. Thank you very much. Bye. Goodbye.